Anyway, this morning, uh, I'll be sharing with you a message I'm titled, Be Prepared. And uh, before I do that, I'd like us just to bow again and have a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, get to the message. Dear Father, we uh, just want to pause and praise you. We thank you for each precious soul that has come out this morning. We thank you that we are able to fellowship together, to worship you in song and in prayer. Uh, and Father, through your word as well, we pray that you would deeply impact our hearts. I pray that you would help me to deliver this message. We pray for each one that is here this morning that our hearts would be humbled before you, our hearts would be open, and that your Holy Spirit would deeply uh, impact us and do a work in us and uh, motivate us, energize us, give us a passion, a uh, greater passion for your kingdom and help us again to impact this community all around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So be prepared is the, uh, uh, the title of my message. And... Uh, I want to just ask, is this thing working? I want to just ask, how many of you, and this is going to be a pretty interactive kind of a message, so we'll be asking uh, questions from time to time. Feel free to sing out uh, an answer. How many of you have, have ever felt a little bit awkward in wanting to witness to someone? My hands up. <laughs> I think you know, many times I feel like if I was to open my mouth and share a little bit about church or about God, it would be a little bit awkward and sometimes I back down. And I choose not to because I think, ah, oh, it's not going to work, I'm not going to listen. I'm hoping and praying that this message will, uh, will turn that around and give us confidence about a method of evangelism, a way of uh, connecting with our community and reaching our community that is uh, not so much confrontational, but very engaging, that will give you opportunities to share with people. Now, I'm just trying to... Is this thing in? It's in. We did do a test run earlier, so we'll just give it a quick, a quick check. So uh, the message is called Be Prepared, and it comes from a uh, scripture in the New Testament, 1 Peter 3, verse 15 and 16, which, which says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. There's the scripture. And the key words there are, be prepared. And so, uh, what sort of questions do we need to be prepared to answer now? So I'll run through a few questions. Some of these may sound familiar to you. You may have had somebody come up to you and ask a question like this. Hasn't evolution proved the Bible wrong? Uh, how could the creation story of Genesis be literally true? Don't fossils and dinosaurs prove evolution? And how can you say that Christianity is the only true religion? And one of the biggest questions uh, that's on a lot of people's minds is to do with death and suffering in the world. How can a loving God allow death and suffering? Have you ever heard questions like that from a work colleague, from uh, friends and relatives? Is that all good? Yeah. Thank you. All right, so uh, before I get into the message, I wanted to share how evolution is not just a side issue. Over half of all Australians say science and evolution is an issue that blocks their interest in Christianity. And by science, they're assuming that evolution is science, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. That's an alarming statistic. Here's another one. 70% of 18 to 35-year-old Australian Christians grew up Christian, but are no longer affiliated. Now, just think about that number. That is alarming. Why is there such an exodus? from churches in our country, our young people. So many of them are choosing not to remain. Why is that? So always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So what is at stake? Before we get into the message, I want to make it clear. What is at stake in this creation versus evolution debate? Number one, the character of God. Is God good? Have we all heard of Sir David Attenborough? I'm sure we've all seen his major documentaries on TV. Now, one time he was being interviewed by a reporter about why he didn't give glory to God, given the, the beautiful creation he sees and, and depicts in his uh, documentaries. And he said this, when creationists talk about God creating, they always instance hummingbirds or orchids sunflowers and beautiful things. I tend to think instead of a parasitic worm that is boring through the eye of a boy sitting on the bank of a river in West Africa, a worm that's going to make him blind. That doesn't seem to me to coincide with a God who's full of mercy. 
Now that is a good question, isn't it? Why is this worm borrowing into somebody a child's eye, making him blind? What kind of a God would create something like that? How would you answer that question? We'll get back to that a little bit later in the message. What else is at stake is the gospel message itself. This is a quote from an atheist. He said, If there never was an Adam and Eve, there never was an original sin. If there never was an original sin, there is no need of salvation. If there is no need of salvation, there is no need of a savior. And I submit that puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, into the ranks of the unemployed. I think that evolution is absolutely the death knell of Christianity. Now he understands the issues. He understands that if Genesis cannot be trusted, if the fall of man, Adam and Eve's fall in the garden, if that didn't happen, there's no basis for Christianity. He understands that very well. Number three, the authority of scripture is at stake. For example, how old is the universe? Well, according to the Bible, about 6,000 years, roughly, according to the genealogies in Genesis and in the Gospel of Luke. Evolutionists say the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. Right? A bit of a contradiction there. I will show you a typical evolutionary timeline. Where is man on this timeline? Where do you see man? Beginning or end? Right down the end, right after a supposed billion and billions and billions uh, of years, right at the end of the timeline. But what did Jesus say in the Gospel of Mark? There we go. So can you advance? There we go. Jesus said, at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Just think about that. We have evolutionists that say man existed or was created or uh, emerged at the end of billions of years of history. Jesus said Adam and Eve were there at the beginning of creation. That phrase, at the beginning of creation, does that allow for any millions or billions of years? Not at all. They were there from the beginning. Here's a little cartoon uh, depicting Adam and Eve. You see Adam and Eve in the garden at the top there, the Garden of Eden. And Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. If you try to add millions of years to that picture, what happens? Adam and Eve would be standing on a fossil graveyard with a record of death and suffering and disease. These fossils have evidence of cancer, arthritis, there are animals inside animals. What kind of a God would create a world like that? So getting straight to the point, this is the gospel that we want to proclaim to a broken uh, and hurting community. God is good. God is good and created a perfect world in the beginning. There was no sin, no death, no suffering, no disease. Everything was perfect, made by a perfect, loving God. Sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin. Right? Through the fall, this perfect creation was plunged into darkness, into a broken world. I'm sure we all identify with that middle image. This is, who would agree this is a broken world that we live in? It's a broken world, there are broken people, and that is where we are today. And that is the whole foundation for the cross. Jesus in scripture is referred to as the last Adam. The first Adam brought sin and death into the world. The last Adam conquered death and rose again, he died on the cross for our sins. He rose again, he ascended to heaven, and one day he is returning to restore this world to the way that it was in the beginning. That is the Bible in one image. That is the message that we proclaim. And that message, that biblical timeline, falls apart as soon as you add millions of years of history or billions of years of history of death and suffering. That whole message breaks down. So if the foundation in Genesis is wrong, Think about that. How can you trust the rest of Scripture? Number four, the basis for right and wrong is at stake. Why is abortion wrong? What would you say? Why, why, do we, why are we opposed to abortion? It's because people are created in the image of God. It is wrong to murder babies. It's wrong to kill, to murder people. Uh, what is wrong with gay marriage? Well, you know, if we just evolved over millions of years and we just made up this institution that we call marriage, then we can define it any way that we want to. However, if God created marriage, he owns it, 
he gets to define what it actually is. So, so much is at stake, and even in the culture wars. Number five, <clears throat> the new heavens and earth are at stake. Let's go back to our image again. Right In the beginning, if, if the true history of the universe involved millions of years of death and suffering, what are we going to return to in the end? Because Genesis and Revelation dovetail, don't they? They go hand in hand. So what was at the beginning is what will be at the end. The truth is, in the beginning it was perfect. Perfect creation made by a loving God. In the end, we will return to that when Jesus comes back and his kingdom is here. But if there's billions of years of death and suffering, and Genesis relates back to that, what have we got to look forward to? It doesn't make any sense. So, so much is at stake. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to consider God's word. What happens if we build all of our thinking on the Bible? And what we're going to do is have an imaginary friend. You can fill in the blank. It could be a loved one who is not a Christian yet. It could be a work colleague, or a friend or a relative who is not yet in the kingdom, somebody who is not yet a believer. And we're going to imagine this person this morning is here, posing questions to you as a Christian. How would you respond? Let's build our thinking on the Bible. Here's the message we proclaim. In Genesis, it says that uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible says that God created the wild animals according to their kinds, and God made man in his own image. Genesis 1, 25 to 27. And because God is good, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good in keeping with his good character. So here are some images of uh, various things that God has created. And uh, who would agree with me? These, these things are beautiful. Do you see a, a beautiful images from God's creation? If our friend uh, David Attenborough was here this morning, he would be saying, you know, this is bias. You're showing all the cute things. You're showing all the, the beautiful things in creation. He would be saying, what about the blood? If you're doing a talk on creation, show some cancer, show some blood, show some gore, right? Because that is his complaint against how can there be a God when there's so much death and violence and suffering in the world. But we have all these beautiful things that I'm showing this morning. Let's move on to Genesis, Genesis 1.30. To all the beasts of the earth, I give every green plant for food, right? All the beasts of the earth, I give every green plant. So how would you describe the animals in the beginning? They were, diet-wise, they were carnivorous or herbivorous, right? They were all planting. Every one of them was plant-eating. And so our skeptical friends might say, well, your Bible says that everything was plant-eating. What about things like lions and tigers? Does that look like a plant-eater to you? Not really? <laughs> what about this one? Does that look like a, 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 a tame, plant-eating creature? Now, our skeptic friends might say, well, yeah, look around, look at sharks, look at lions, look at tigers. How can you say that, that these things were created to be very good, to be plant-eating? How can that possibly be true? Here's where I want to share a few stories from Creation Magazine. In this picture, we see tigers and pigs together. This was an article in Creation Magazine. And uh, in a zoo uh, over in Thailand, they actually raised these creatures together in the same enclosures. They were nursing off each other. They were uh, raised in the same location. And as you can see from the pictures, none of them are fearful. The piglets are not running away from the tiger. The tiger doesn't feel like eating them. They grew up perfectly tame. And what this does, there was a creation magazine, it tells us, it shows us an example of how the big cat kind doesn't have to be a ravenous killer. Right? A tiger can live in perfect harmony with little uh, piglets. Here's another one, uh, Kruger National Park, a lion observed to be um, yeah, dwelling in, in peace with this little, uh, little deer or antelope. Little deer. Right? What about sharks? This is a shark named Florence. It was in the news a little while ago. A vegetarian shark named Florence. This shark was discovered with a rusty fish hook in its mouth, which was removed, and the shark was donated to an aquarium in England. And they found uh, in this aquarium that the shark refused to eat fish. You know, come feeding time, they threw the fish in, there's normally a, a feeding frenzy for the sharks. And uh, to their amazement, this thing would not eat fish. Right, here's some photos. There's a, a lady there feeding lettuce, right? They could feed it lettuce, 
They could feed cucumbers, carrots, things like that, but it would not eat fish. Something happened to it where it, it ceased to be a, a, a meat eater, a carnivore, and it became herbivorous. There was an article in, um, in Creation magazine. What about piranhas? Could they possibly be very good? Can you imagine a piranha? I mean, what do you think of when you hear the word piranha? Yeah. <laughs> Who's seen those old seventies movies with you know, people falling in the river and all these piranhas come and eat? Piranhas are actually omnivorous. They can eat meat or plants, right? But there is a species, a variety of piranha called the paku. It even looks like it's smiling, doesn't it? This is a, a variant of the, um, of the piranhas that is actually solely plant eating. So even creatures like sharks, piranhas, lions, tigers, observable today, there are some cases where they can be perfectly tame, perfectly you know, plant eating, harmless, and it, it helps to lend support, gives us confidence in the creation account in Genesis. It is not really that far-fetched that everything can be very good, including dinosaurs, the original cat kind, whatever that looked like. Whatever God made was very good because scripture says everything God made was very good. In Isaiah, the Bible even talks about a future time when the wolf will live with the lamb. Now, what does the wolf normally do with the lamb? Right. Uh, the leopard will lie down with the goat. What does a leopard normally do with a goat? It's a snack. Right? Um, the lion and the yearling together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. That's what the Bible says. The lion will eat straw like an ox. Now, if you were making up the Bible, if it was just a man-made book, would you write something like that that people wouldn't believe? But it's in God's word. The lion will eat straw like an ox. That's God's word. Now, in Creation Magazine, there was an article called The Lion uh, That Never Ate Meat. And this was a, a lion uh, cub that was donated to a family in America. They had a property, they had a farm. They raised this cub, and to their amazement, it would not eat meat. They tried to feed it meat uh, many, you know, multiple times. It just would not eat meat. Uh, can you guys see the, the photo on the left? What is in front of the, the lion? Do you see that? Look at the one on the left. Look under its chin. Do you see that? Right, little kittens. Does the kitten look afraid? Not at all. Chicken nuggets over there. They're not chicken nuggets. They're, he's leaving them alive. They're, they're playing and frolicking together. Perfectly at peace. I've got a photo here of the, uh, the lady. You know, can you imagine a full-grown lion licking your neck? And why, why is she willing to do that? That, that thing has power to, to snap her neck. But she's not afraid because she's raised this thing and it just never ate meat. The, uh, there's a lion in the lamb, they're feeding it milk. They took this lion, uh, lioness to a butcher one time to try to see whether the butcher could get it to eat meat. And it would not eat meat. So what does that tell us? It is feasible, it is reasonable to believe in a large cat, a big cat kind, created in the beginning in the Garden of Eden, that is perfectly tame, harmless, plant eating. It happens today sometimes, rarely, but these are modern day accounts where that sort of thing has happened. Let's apply what we've learned so far, quiz time. I want you guys to pretend you're digging in your garden, you've got a shovel, you're digging, and uh, you, your shovel hits something hard, and you dig up this skull. What would you say it is? Is it a meat eater or a plant eater? I want to ask for a show of hands. Who says it looks like a, a meat eater? Who says it looks like a plant eater? Very good. <laughs> Didn't Jesus make the dinosaurs as well as all the other Everything. That's really everything. Really everything. He made everything. And whatever this creature is, now we look at those fangs and we assume, we're conditioned to assume that it is a meat eater, but it's actually a plant eater. It was a skull of a panda. It's just a panda. Not like eating bamboo. You're digging a bit further and you dig up this thing, all right? Bigger skull, uh, fangs. Again, who thinks it's a meat eater? Who thinks it's a plant eater? True question again. It is a male camel, right? Herbivorous. It has fangs, but it's a, it's a male camel. Another question. You're digging further, another skull. Who says meat eater? Who says plant eater? Right? It is, it's a fruit bat. It's a skull of a fruit bat. And the thing is, the, the point I'm making here is sharp teeth just means sharp teeth. Yeah. That's all it is. A kitchen knife is just a knife, isn't it? You might use a knife for slicing mango or steak. It's just a sharp knife. 
sharp teeth are just sharp teeth. Uh, we're conditioned to interpret things a certain way, right? but these skulls I've been showing you, they're just plant eaters. Yes, they have fangs. The point is sharp teeth and claws does not have to mean meat eater. We can defend Genesis. We can defend God is good. He made all these creatures very good. And yes, there's sharp teeth, but they could eat coconuts, mangoes, fruit, pineapples. You're digging a bit further. Another skull turns up, even bigger than all the rest, bigger than all the rest put together. Who says, who says meat eater? Every hand plant eater in the beginning, right? Even this, the original created kind, whatever Adam would have named it, Yes, there are uh, teeth and claws, but as we've seen, it doesn't have to mean carnivore. So Tyrannosaurus Rex in the beginning, let's reimagine T-Rex. So I forget what you see on Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. In the beginning, that original created kind, something similar to that, would have been plant eating, according to Genesis 1.30. If the Bible is true, it says all the beasts of the earth, including dinosaurs. God's creation, however, did not remain very good for long. Genesis 2, God told Adam and Eve, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. And the Bible says that they succumbed to temptation, they partook of the fruit, sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. So everything was corrupted. Uh, if you look around, anybody into gardening, who likes uh, you know, flowers, roses, things like that? Let's take a look at this one. Do you see what happened to the plant kingdom? Thorns and thistles. It's a beautiful rose, but it's been corrupted. The animal kingdom. Uh, evidently, some of these creatures have repurposed their equipment, haven't they? And these days, we see the big cats behaving more like this. Uh, those on the receiving end of those teeth and claws would not be saying this is a very good creation, would they? There is something dreadfully wrong with this world that we're living in. It's a broken world. We've got a picture here of, uh, imagine if you were that, uh, that antelope <laughs> uh, running away and you know, the zebra. Yeah, there is something wrong with that. Now, interestingly today, we, we actually find this kind of thing still happening, similar thing happening where animals can change their diet. This is the vampire finch. I read about this in Creation magazine. And it uh, turns out on this island in the Galapagos, they ran out of their berry supply. They're normally eating berries and things like that. When their food supply ran out, what do you do? You've got to eat something. And one of them decided, I'm going to try that bird down there. Because it's an island, that larger bird, it can't fly away. It's just basically sitting there being eaten alive. And they call, they call this thing the vampire finch. And it illustrates how a creature's diet can actually change from carnivore to her, from herbivore to carnivore. Right, the bear kind, do we see changes there? Some will use their equipment for eating fish, some for eating plants. Right? It's just teeth, it's just sharp teeth and claws. So moving on, the plant kingdom was corrupted, the animal kingdom was corrupted, and sadly, mankind was corrupted. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. King David said, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. How can somebody be sinful at birth when they haven't even done anything? It's because we are descended from Adam. We inherit the sin nature of Adam because he became separated from God. His children were born in that image. Still the image of God, but separated from him. So Adam and Eve's children, they had many, many children, sons and daughters, the Bible says. They were born into this world in the image of God, but separate from him. And all of us as well, we were born into this world, separated from God. And hopefully we've been born again. Yeah. But we need to be born again. So our friend, getting back to our friend, this is your work colleague, your, your, your neighbor, your... A uh, friend or your relative, they say, what about fossils? How can you say death only came about through Adam's sin? Don't fossils prove that death has been happening for millions of years? Everyone knows that, right? Fossils are how old? Millions of years old. There's a record of death and suffering. How can the Bible be true? Well, let's take a look at some fossils. All right, here we go. We've got a creationist and an evolutionist. Notice they are arguing about the same fossil. The creation-evolution debate is not about us as Christians gathering as much evidence as we can on our side versus whatever evidence evolutionists can gather on their side. It's not about that. 
The truth is, the evidence is all the same, isn't it? We have the same fossils, same rock layers, same everything. Right? But we interpret that evidence in the context of our worldview, whether it's millions of years or a biblical worldview. So there they are arguing uh, over this fossil. Here's a coelacanth fossil. Have you heard of coelacanth before? Right? Uh, supposedly from 360 million years ago. Could such a creature uh, be alive today, do you think? Yes. yes. Right, some of us have heard of this one. There's a photo here of a, a diver swimming with one. Right? And evolutionists, these were discovered since 1938. And evolutionists, what they do is they put a, a different label on it, they call it a living fossil. But it turns out they're still around. Right? And there are something like 500 living fossils, uh, so to speak, in the world today. Let's look at another one, Tyrannosaurus rex, supposedly 65 million years old. Well, have you heard of Mary Schweitzer and her discoveries in Montana? She discovered a T-Rex femur, you've heard of that? A T-Rex femur, they sliced it open and they found red blood cells inside. They call these soft tissue fossils. How can that possibly be millions of years old? These photos, you're looking at the inside of a T-Rex bone. Flexible ligaments, stretchy parts, and there are many other examples like that. I don't have time to go through them today, but they call them soft tissue fossils. It shouldn't even exist if these fossils were really 65 million years old. Here's a, one of my favorite ones. This, is, this was found in Canada, it's a Nodosaurus. And uh, when they discovered this, it was miners digging into, uh, you're digging a mine in Canada. They came across this carcass. It's like a dinosaur mummy. And they, uh, they excavated it, went to a to museum, scientists analyzed it, they were just blown away. One scientist even said, this thing looks like it died a couple of weeks ago. That's his words. Right? It, was, it, would look, it looked that recent. There was, uh, there was skin scales, uh, pigment, stomach contents. How can it be millions of years old? And I drew a picture, I think I have it on the slide here. Uh, some of you have, have seen uh, my artwork down the back. I draw pictures when I come across fossils like this or uh, articles like this in Creation Magazine or elsewhere, I think, wow, we can use that as Christians to refute evolution. So I'll do a sketch. And so uh, that's the, the picture I drew. I researched uh, Canadian uh, you know, uh, ancient tribes and things and um, drew that. So when people ask, yeah, why did you draw a dinosaur with TVs? I can tell the story of the dinosaur mummy. I can establish evidence for a young earth. And by talking about a young earth, I can explain, you know, death only came through Adam's sin. And within minutes, I've laid a foundation for sharing the solution to that problem. Yeah. Talk about the first Adam, naturally transitions to the last Adam. What about fossils? Uh, our, our, our friend is still not convinced. Right? They hear that uh, you know, fossils, uh, rock layers, so, you know, were formed over millions of years. Fossils, they happen when a creature swims along in the ocean and it dies and it sinks slowly and it's gradually covered over. Have we heard that story before about how fossils are formed? Now what happens in reality is when creatures die in the water they float. And I read this article uh, in Creation Magazine about a southern right whale uh, in South Australia. It was seen uh, you know, floating just offshore, this big black carcass, and people are thinking what is that thing? And they were going out in boats having a closer look, uh, lots of tourists on the beach, there were people uh, opportunistic uh, people that had boats, they said, look, you give us some money, we'll take you up for a closer look. And looking at those photos, look at the bottom one, down the bottom there, there, was, there were people, uh, more than one person actually jumped out of a boat onto the whale that was, you know, dead, dead carcass there, and sharks, there were great white sharks swimming up and tearing chunks off this whale. And cut a long story short, the, the authorities had to blow up the whale to force it to sink. Right? Which illustrates how what happens in real life is creatures die, scavengers come, they pick it apart, you don't get a fossil. In order to get a fossil, you need to have rapid burial. Is there anything in the Bible that describes rapid burial? Is there any event in the Bible that could cause millions of creatures to be buried? The flood, obviously, all right? Uh, and when you look at fossils, they give evidence not of you know, slower processes, but rapid burial. How do we know this creature was buried rapidly? What do you see? What's it actually doing? Can you see? It's giving birth. There's a little baby ichthyosaur. This is an ichthyosaur fossil. There we go. 
right? And it's actually giving birth. There's a baby ichthyosaur. So it was in the process of giving birth when it was essentially snap frozen in time or fossilized uh, in time and uh, obviously happened very quickly. Fossils have this, uh, what they call the asphyxiation pose. We just go back to the previous slide. Apologies, there's a bit of a lag in this. There, there's a there's a mystery, you know, for evolutionists, they can't really explain what happened to the dinosaurs, but for us as Christians, given the, the biblical record, uh, there are plenty of examples, well, in scripture it talks about every created kind going on the ark and off the ark, and we have dragon legends all over the world. Uh, I'm not sure what's happened with the, the clicker here, it's kind of gone ahead a little bit, but that's okay. Um, one thing I wanted to point out about rock layers, when people talk about not just fossils, but rock layers, uh, you know, representing millions and millions of years of time, I want to point out that rock layers are, are smooth. Right? If you look at these pictures, right, can you see the, the curly, the wavy formations there on the photo on the left? How could that happen over millions of years? That entire thing happened in one event while the rock was still soft. It was mushed up and lifted and heaved up into that kind of a formation. It's not about rock layers being laid down slowly over time. It's about... Um, rock layers being smooth. And uh, I've seen even around uh, central Queensland, you know, cliff faces and things where you look at bands of rock and they're smooth. Now think about this, look at the Grand Canyon. If we go back to the Grand Canyon, right? <laughs> look at that one. Now in the Grand Canyon, there's this Mississippian layer and the Cambrian layer, and there's just 160 million years of time, according to the geological time scale that evolution is talking about, 160 million years missing. Now, if, if you have those, those sandy colored rock layers and then you wait 160 million years before the rest of those reddish layers, what should you see along the top of that, the, the, the sandy rock? It should be eroded, it should be crevices, it should be erosion, it should be a zigzag kind of a thing. And if each rock layer took millions of years to, to lay down and then millions of years till the next one comes and so forth, we should have a zigzag pattern. But what do we see? Smooth bands of rock. It speaks to a global catastrophe. So let's move on. Next slide. Some more examples here. You know, smooth bands of rock. So if somebody says, what about rock layers? Don't they prove the Earth is millions of years old? We can say, well, rock layers are smooth. That's powerful evidence for a global flood. Rock layers can form rapidly. Mount St. Helens volcano. You might have seen briefly those uh, pictures of the volcano that, that were up on the screen. Mount St. Helens volcano erupted in 1980. And uh, about, I think it was a couple of years later, there was a massive ice flow from the top of the remains of the mountain, the Calda Canyon, right through the volcanic debris that was left behind in 1980. And you can walk into this canyon, you can see the rock layers, and it would have happened in one afternoon. Right? So there's evidence in, in modern times that rock layers can form quickly. So the point is, if rock layers can be formed quickly, then the fossils that are found in those rock layers don't have to be millions of years old. And that's, by the way, how they date fossils. They go, well, the fossil was found in, in this layer, and the layer is X million years old, so therefore the fossil is as well. Right? That all goes out the window if we can establish that, fossil, that rock layers happen very quickly. So if dinosaurs coexisted with man, where is the evidence? We're going to run through a few examples. This is Carlisle Cathedral in England, and uh, uh, on the lower level there, there is a tomb, Bishop Bell's tomb, and it has animals carved in brass all around the tomb. And one particular example, if you look at the, uh, the slide, have a look at that. What would you say that is? Thank you. Right, medieval brass work, what is it? What would you say? Looks like dinosaurs, long-necked dinosaurs, and it's carved into brass, and that's only about 500 years old. So, isn't that reasonable to assume if they carved them, they would have seen them? Mm. Yeah, it looks quite accurate. It's a yeah, long, looks like a long-necked dinosaur, the tail held aloft, there were spikes on the end of the tail. This is a picture I drew. Uh, again, people ask, why did you draw dinosaurs with a castle? And I say, well, let me tell you the story. It's, there's a carving, it's not that old. Yeah, it suggests that dinosaurs and people coexisted. And, and once again, what am I really doing? I'm telling interesting stories, but really establishing a young earth. And death only came through Adam. And there's the foundation for the gospel. That is what this is about. Temple of 
Tar Prime in Cambodia, another example, right? What would you say that is? Who knows the dinosaurs? Stegosaurus. Well, Stegosaurus. Stegosaurus. Right? It's a Stegosaurus. And uh, there's a sketch there as well. And by the way, um, uh, anybody who, who subscribes to Creation Magazine after the, the talk is finished, I brought some artwork in the back you may have seen. So I'm giving these away for free. Anybody who, who subscribes to the magazine, you're welcome to choose a, a dinosaur picture to take uh, as well. And you can use that for evangelism too. Uh, who knows what this is? Chinese. Zodiac. Chinese zodiac. I've shown that before. Chinese zodiac. And uh, it has you know, monkeys, roosters, dogs, pigs, etc. And a dragon. Right? And the Chinese, I mean, they wouldn't just have 11 real animals and randomly throw in a mythical beast. For the, for in, in Chinese history, dragons were considered to be real creatures, historic animals. There we go. <laughs> so again, uh, one of my sketches, just trying to make people uh, curious, trying to make people think there is a connection between dragons and dinosaurs. I have uh, the dragon shadow with the Dilophosaurus. Uh, on our resources table, we have a book called Dire Dragons. It has uh, examples like this from all around the world, cultures all over the world. Does the Bible say something about dinosaurs and man coexisting? Who's heard of Behemoth in the Bible? Job chapter 40, Behemoth, a creature whose tail sways like a cedar tree. There's a photo of a cedar tree. Can you imagine a creature with a tail as big as that? Now, in, uh, in some Bibles, uh, beginning with the, the King James Version uh, from 1611, by, by the 1600s, it seems that the dinosaurs by and large were extinct. They were beginning to fade from memory. And the King James Version had footnotes at Job saying this behemoth, this creature, and then Leviathan was another one, possibly an elephant or a hippopotamus, something like that. Some newer translations have copied that as well and have footnotes like that. But really, what creature has a tail like a cedar tree? Probably something like that, a long neck dinosaur. Leviathan, uh, amazing description in Job 41. Sparks of fire shooting from its mouth, smoke pours from its nostrils. His breath sets coals ablaze, flames dart from his mouth. Yeah, people go, how can that be real? Have you heard of the bombardier beetle? I'm sure some of you have. It's a beetle in South America. It actually has biological mechanisms in its body that can, that it can mix these chemicals that create hot gases 100 degrees to ward off predators. Wow. But the biology exists today. This isn't even extinct. It has these chambers, uh, separate chambers and inhibitors and all kinds of chemicals. So a predator comes along like a spider and it'll just get um, steamed <laughs> pretty much by, by hot gases and smoke. Have you ever heard this theory? But we know that dinosaurs evolved into birds, don't we? Who's ever heard that before? Right, the theory that dinosaurs didn't actually go extinct, but somehow evolved over millions of years into birds. Well, here's an article, how dinosaurs shrank and became birds. That is the evolutionary narrative. You'll hear about it in school, uh, you'll hear it on TV, in the movies. Who's watched Jurassic World? Right, Jurassic Park movies, Jurassic World, right? We have these ideas creeping in. This is a museum we went to years ago, my son uh, Jordan there. Got him to pose for this. I thought this is a good photo opportunity. I'll use this one day, and here I am using the photo. Um, and it's a velociraptor. Uh, in the museum display, what you see is the bones. But behind the bones, there is a story, a picture. Right? They want us to believe that these creatures had feathers on them. Here's a velociraptor from the original Jurassic Park movie in the early 90s. Have a look how it changed by Jurassic Park 3. You see the feathers starting to sprout? Because people wrote in, they complained, they said, your, your velociraptors look too reptilian. Yeah, we know they evolved into birds, make them look more bird-like. In the uh, Jurassic World franchise, they kind of went back to reptilian-style dinosaurs, and once again, they were criticized, right? But this is a dumb, you know, monster movie, you should have feathers on the dinosaurs. And so the latest one, I think it's still in the cinemas, they have this ridiculous looking thing, like an oversized turkey. Again, to, to, to peddle this narrative that, that dinosaurs evolved into birds. National Geographic had a story, right? A missing link of this creature, a dinosaur with feathers. There's the evidence, fossil evidence. We've proved it. Turns out it was a hoax. There was a, a Chinese farmer who actually glued uh, a fossil of a dromaeosaur 
dinosaur with fossil feathers. If I can maybe zoom in, I think there's a slide. Right, the, the head and body of a primitive bird and the tail and hind legs of a dromaeosaur were glued together by a Chinese farmer. Right, there was a market in this. Right? Could dinosaurs have had feathers? Well, we don't really know. You know uh, if they did, it doesn't really necessarily contradict the Bible, but the evidence that's been put forward so far is not convincing. And uh, this one, of course, is a hoax. Right? Reptiles breathe in and out. Birds have a circulatory respiratory system. So can you imagine how one could possibly evolve into the other? It doesn't make any sense. The breathing apparatus is different. And, and you know, the, the dinosaur I drew over here on the side, the T-Rex chasing a chicken, that's really to poke fun at the evolutionists because I can't think of two more radically different creatures than a chicken and a Tyrannosaurus rex, can you? But they literally say T-Rex evolved into chickens over millions of years. I have an article here. Uh, somebody gave this to me a few years ago. Elephant-sized bird breathed like, sorry, elephant-sized dinosaur breathed like a bird. We need to be prepared to answer questions like this, especially with Jurassic World and these movies that, that peddle that, that narrative. Why well, we've already seen the respiratory system is completely different. We can debunk this idea pretty quickly. The Chinese farmer gluing fossils together. We, it's not, not too hard to debunk or at least to challenge the evidence that's put forward. But I said to my friend who, who gave me this article, what really stands out to me is the article on the left, schools more of a jungle. Can you see the connection? If we are teaching our children, our young people, that you are just an accident, you just evolved, you're just an animal, there's no meaning, no purpose, you're number one, just do what you want. Is it any wonder that we have this kind of situation in some schools uh, across Queensland and across the country. This is Brisbane schools, right? Out of control, some of them. Ideas have consequences. Our, our friends, our evolutionary skeptic friends might say, well, evolution is science though. I want us to understand this about natural selection and evolution. Can you tell the difference between these two things? Natural selection and evolution. It is vital as Christians that we can tell the difference between these two things because on those nature documentaries and science shows, they muddle this up. They'll say evolution is true, but give an example of natural selection. They are actually opposites. I want to illustrate that with some dogs, all right? Opera, sorry, natural selection is operational science. It's observable, testable, repeatable, things we can do in the present. Natural selection we observe in the present, happening today. Right, happens all the time. Evolution is what we might call origins science. Can we travel back in time to observe what happened? We can't do that. So here are some dogs. I want us to understand this. Natural selection is essentially information loss. If you start with a wolf kind and breed, uh, breed some puppies, you can have variation within that kind. Some might have long, longish hair like the, the wolf. Some might have a bit longer, some might have shorter. But if you put these uh, dogs in the outback, which ones would survive, do you think, in that kind of environment? Long hair or short hair? Short hair. And so natural selection is information loss. You lose information for longer hair. Does that make sense? That's pretty much how natural selection works. It's a downhill process. Natural selection. Nature selects. Some survive, others don't, and you lose those genes. It's a downward, it's a downhill progression. With evolution, it's the opposite. Evolution means information gain. To turn slime into everything, what do you need? Genetic information, time and again, to produce lungs and eyes and gills and, and whatever, you name it. So they are complete opposites. If we apply that to what we learn in school, right, this is from high school, uh, I think it's year 10 curriculum, Australian curriculum, one of the descriptors says this, the theory of evolution by natural selection explains the diversity of living things and is supported by a range of scientific evidence. Sound good? Sound scientific? Sounds plausible? If we apply what we just learned, what is evolution? Information gain. So what they're really saying is the theory of information gain by information loss explains the diversity of living things and is supported by a range of scientific evidence. But do you see how, how, how much confusion there is out there? 
And most teachers just don't know the difference. We, watch, we see this sort of stuff on TV. We don't realize the contradiction. Evolution and natural selection are opposites. Some say, well, mutations can explain the new information. Well, there's a mutation, mutated snake. Is there any new information there? It's just extra information. It's not feathers or anything particularly new. It's just extra genes that we already had and, and, and don't need. Uh, a cow with an extra leg or two, again, nothing new. So let me finish with this. What do you do when something is broken? What do you do? Fix it. Fix it. All right? And we live in a broken world. Right? The perfect world through Adam and Eve's sin uh, was corrupted right? by sin and death. We live in a broken world. Sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin. The Bible says Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. There is the foundation for the gospel in a nutshell. And we're looking forward to a restored world in the future when Jesus returns. This message breaks down if death was normal for millions of years. What will the new heavens and new earth look like? Again, just quickly, I'll share a story, uh, a couple of scriptures and a story. Revelation tells us that God will wipe every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. There'll be a tree of life once again. No longer will there be any curse. And uh, there was an article in Creation Magazine called Echoes of Eden. This was a lioness in Kenya. And uh, it, uh, it actually adopted a baby antelope. Did it several times. You know, do lions normally do that? No. But isn't it a powerful story to illustrate that creatures like big cats can be very good, just like the Bible says in the beginning. And this lioness you know, would, would forage for food and, and uh, you know, look after this, this little um, antelope. Getting back to David Attenborough, remember his question about the, the worm burrowing into the eye of a child in Africa, remember that? How do we answer that? One thing we need to do is hold people accountable Hold people accountable to their own worldview. I was to get a lie. So he's referencing a boy and a worm. Think about this. He's referencing a worm and a boy. And if we hold him accountable to his worldview, there they are. It's just random, isn't it? There's the evolutionary tree. No purpose, no meaning. Everything's just blind chance. Everything's evolving. There's a branch here, a branch there. There's a chicken, there's a pig. There's a boy, there's a worm. Who cares? In other words, does David Attenborough have any basis for complaining? He doesn't. If he were, if he, if he were to be consistent with his worldview, he should just keep his mouth shut. Stuff happens. It is what it is. Right? He's actually stealing from our worldview by insinuating that humans are more valuable than animals. Only we can do that. Because on the authority of God's word, People are created in the image of God. Our evolutionist friends don't have that. For them, this is all just bags of chemicals. A cat, a dog, a human, a cow, whatever. Just random. So, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And I'm going to call for a response to, to this message. There are things that you can do. Here are three ways to be prepared. Number one is the website, rawbitofcreation.com. Uh, what we do with our outreach, if somebody asks us a question we're not sure of, I have a shortcut on my phone, I go straight to creation.com, you can type in keywords and there'll be a whole bunch of articles that answer questions that skeptics have about the creation evolution debate. Right? So creation.com, very easy uh, website to remember. There's also a free email newsletter called Infobytes. And uh, how many of you got that little bookmark on your way in? It's got a QR code on it, right? You can use your phone. And uh, if you take a picture, have a look, Next Level Church, it'll come up with a screen like that. You can put in your, your name, your postcode, your email address, and receive a free email newsletter every couple of weeks. For example, somebody might find a fossil out west, there's an evolutionary story on the radio, on TV, people are talking about it at work. What is our response? Well, InfoBytes, free email newsletter will help you, will address things like that and help you to come up with answers to discuss that and stand up for a biblical worldview. Stones and Bones, we're giving away for anybody who signs up to our free email newsletter just to get you started on your uh, resource table. 
uh, venture if you want to have a look at uh, the other resources. This is free, right? A booklet, excellent witnessing tool. Uh, highly recommend sign up for InfoBytes. Just give your email address, have a free book to start you off, read it and give it away. And of course, have a look at the other resources that are on the tables down the back. Also, Creation Magazine. And really, the things I've been sharing this morning come straight from Creation Magazine. All I'm doing is sharing stories, establishing a young earth, death through Adam, laying the foundation for the gospel, and then sharing the gospel. Creation Magazine helps you to demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Here's a testimony from somebody who said, I was converted when someone gave me a Creation Magazine. Then I subscribed for five of my relatives. Four of them have now come to the Lord. This is how powerful that particular resource is. You guys make evangelism easy. I just give a creation magazine to somebody, and then the next time I see them, we talk about it. Now, in our church in Gladstone, people subscribe to creation magazine, they read it, they give me the, the issue afterwards, and then we give them away at our markets outreach. I'll show you some um, other examples of that as well. Here's a baptism from a few years ago. The man in the middle there, he was an ardent evolutionist, a skeptic, who, a scoffer, you could say, who, who thought, you know, you guys are crazy you know, believing in God. Tell you what, as soon as he understood that natural selection and evolution are opposites, his belief system came crashing down. And very shortly thereafter, he became a Christian. And this is his baptism. So Creation Magazine, there's a section for kids. Can we go back to the previous slide there? Um, there's a digital version, so if you subscribe, um, one year, three years, there's a digital version accessible on up to five devices. So you can get the magazine for yourself, send a link to your, your kids, grandkids, work colleagues, whoever you're, you're praying for, and you get these extra uh, editions in a digital format. There's creation for kids in every magazine as well, so if you have children, great um, tool for uh, helping to fortify their faith. Now, uh, if you subscribe today, if you go for the three year, well, either the one year or the three year subscription, you get a free magazine. And if you go for the three year subscription, which is actually cheaper, you get $15 to spend, a right? $15 voucher, where you can uh, apply that to anything else you purchase off the resource table. And I'm also giving away uh, dinosaur art, let me just, uh, there's the voucher. Uh, Henny and Belinda down the back, they came with me from Batson in that corner there. Make sure you see them. Uh, they're running the resource table. And uh, anybody who subscribes to the magazine will get uh, their choice of a free uh, dinosaur print uh, that you can take home and again use that for witnessing. So, Creation Ministries, this is essentially what we do. Uh, we provide the material, the resources, and uh, it's up to you, it's really over to you to uh, avail yourself of these resources and then pass them on to that person you are praying for. Friends, family, uh, workmates, put it in waiting rooms if you know any uh, uh, doctor's surgery or whatever, dentist, anybody that's willing to have magazines. Consider a gift subscription, give one to your neighbor and then touch base with them. Consider a market sale, which is how we use uh, these resources in Gladstone. This is the Botanic Gardens. We set up a, a six meter gazebo and uh, a display very similar to what you see down the back of the, the church building. And we set this up. Uh, yeah, we get thousands of people come through the markets and the dinosaurs, the images, you see the, the T-Rex blood cells down the back, the brass carvings, it just draws people in. People go, what's this? And so we do essentially what I've been sharing this morning. We share about uh, establishing a young earth, that's what these stories point to, it's solid evidence for a young earth. Death only came through Adam, there's two of my sons there that help out. Death only came through Adam, and before you know it, we're sharing uh, the gospel. We've laid a foundation, we've introduced the problem, death through Adam, and the solution is the cross. And it's such a natural way of sharing the gospel, and people come in, it, it's not threatening in any way, but it allows people to hopefully become curious and ask questions. If they are uh, fruit that's riper for the picking, we can go a little bit further. If, they, if that's all they can take, they can move on. You can't force anyone to believe. But what this does do is it creates opportunity for witness. The Answers book, another resource I highly recommend. 
So I'm going to leave it, with, leave it at that. Um, this is how I want to really challenge you guys and encourage you to respond. Start with the, the magazine, uh, get a subscription happening, use it to fortify your own faith, share the magazine with, with a neighbor or a relative. Uh, you get a free back issue and a dinosaur drawing. Uh, secondly, don't forget email, uh, the free email newsletter. Make sure you sign up for that, get a free Spurns and Bones booklet, and then take your time to browse and uh, see what else you may be led uh, to use. So um, I might hand back over to Pastor Nigel. Thank you.